Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young here on another day going through fall camp 18 days away from the start of K-State football season as the Wildcats prepare for UT Martin and then the subsequent games after that. And yesterday we got to hear from the position coaches and also D.Y. and Drew got to look at practice. So if you haven't gotten Drew's breakdown of what he liked, some of the notable things from the open practice portion yesterday, go back and watch that video now over on the KSO YouTube. But in addition to that, position coaches from the defensive side of the ball, they gave their thoughts on everything happening, and it really didn't slow down the hype machine that is building for the K-State defense. And we'll talk about it tomorrow, breaking down what Joe Klanderman said. Joe Klanderman didn't do anything to kind of slow that down either. (laughs) Yeah, and then the players were out there. Like, there is so much good news and vibes around the K-State defense right now, uh, which is probably good for them to get some of that praise because so much focus has been on Avery Johnson, DJ Giddens, Dylan Edwards, and Keegan Johnson, basically, on what the offense might end up looking like. But the defense is looking good, so we'll talk about uh, what the position coaches had to say here in a little bit. And, and, and not to pat ourselves on our back, but you, Drew, and I have all been saying all off season, look, the defense at worst is going to start way ahead of the offense this yeah. year and will have to be relied upon in the first handful of games maybe to carry this team, specifically yeah. against someone like in Arizona. And hopefully they don't have they're not still doing it by game five against Oklahoma State, but you know, obviously don't rule that out either. And it's it was just like a little bit of simple math. It's like, look at all this returning production on defense. Add in the fact you're not switching coordinators. Add in the fact that everyone that knows ball is saying they're also the deepest defensive unit that they've had since they've been in Manhattan. And it's and they were like both until the Iowa State game. And, and I know that's always like the bugaboo of every show we do. But until the Iowa State game, that's a top 10 defense in the country when it comes to points per drive it's a top two or three defense in the big 12 when it comes to points per drive and when they're losing next to nobody from that unit and probably improving upon that because i think they've upgraded at a few spots too just because they do such a good job when it comes to transfer acquisition on the defensive side of the ball and yeah I bet for a while there, the defensive players were probably like rolling their eyes at all the <laughs> headlines and stuff. We're like, we're, we're better than the offense right now. Yeah. Uh, before we dive into the words from a couple of the position coaches, it is a good time to remind everybody that we are getting closer to being exactly one year out from the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. And what better way to kick off the 2025 college football season then cheering on K-State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. It's over in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, ireland.com so uh drew and i talked a little bit about it yesterday we are 11 days away now from this year's version of the Aer Lingus college football classic which will have florida state and georgia tech playing in it that will be the first game of the college football season college game day will be there this season uh and i think the expectation would be that that's probably the treatment that next year's game gets because i mean yes you have florida state playing in the game this year but you're thinking about junior season Avery Johnson uh I I mean Iowa State will be in the same boat where a lot of their young talent will be a year uh, year older and kind of in the peak of everything it's a conference matchup in one of the most wide open leagues in the country uh next year's game theoretically should be even better and more hyped than the Florida State Georgia Tech one that's coming up so I would imagine it gets that treatment and it'll be exciting uh to be over there and see how K-State and Iowa State uh, go at it uh, in Ireland. I was wrong, by the way. Not top 10 points per drive allowed. I think it was top 30, but still uh, top 30 well, in the Big 12, I, th- I believe. Have, top 10 in my heart. Yeah. And uh, going to that game, uh, and we'll be there, of course, but uh, alluding to that Kansas State-Iowa State game in Ireland, 
Iowa State has a chance to be pretty good next year. Yeah, they, they, they bring back a lot of dudes, and me and you have said it. We don't I mean we're not cyclone apologists by any means on this show. Yes, I hate but, them. But Rock, but we have respect for Rocco Beck. He's a dude. Yeah, yep. That is, unfortunately, I do have respect for Rocco Beck. All right, uh, let's go into it and start with some of the takeaways from what the position coaches had to say yesterday. Now. Uh, a, a bit of a, a reminder, you you get four of them on the defensive side of the ball because there was Van Malone, who he was in a bigger setting because he's the assistant head coach in addition to coaching the corners. And then you got all the position guys like Buddy Wyatt with the defensive ends, Steve Stannard with the linebackers, and Mike Tuiasa-Sopo with the interior defensive linemen. I'll let you go wherever you want to first. Who was the most notable speaker yesterday? that maybe dropped a quote or two that really got you thinking and driving your gears. Actually it was Tui. So uh, I will start there, but I will lead off with a question. What's the difference between Malone and Wells titles? Well, Van is the assistant head coach and Wells is the associate head coach. Um, I couldn't really tell you what they mean. I do know, though. They mean more money. That's what they mean. I think associate head coach is higher than assistant head coach because Sean Snyder's title was associate head coach, I'm pretty sure, at K-State. Okay. And there's no way that there would be another title that was higher than that that he would not have gotten there. So, Oh, whoa. whoa. So, what yeah, makes you really, think that? <laughs> really, Matt Wells is the Sean Snyder legacy coach on this team, if you yeah. want to view it that well, way. Well, a Big 12 head coach, he deserves it. Um, yeah, I'll start with Tui. Malone probably spoke the longest, obviously, because he was given you know, that title. He gets that air time. I think Van went longer than Joe Klanderman today, the defensive coordinator. He did. I think Van went a full 30 minutes where I think Connor Riley went like 14 and Klanderman went like 13 or something. Um, and Van will go 10 minutes by himself before questions. So that that's, that's part of the deal, too. Uh, I think he enjoys that part of the process. For two the reason why I say that, I forget the question I asked of him because I think it was his answer to me, but he basically said, Oh, he, Uso's been good. Um, had his three best days of camp essentially, but Damian Eli Leo is the starter. So what he said, and he acted like Damian Eli Leo started last year, which I don't think it was the case. I'd, so maybe he got his wires crossed, but that struck me as a little bit surprising. I, I, then addressed it, and you guys will, will hear us discuss Joe Klanerman's presser. So I addressed it with him, and he seemed a little bit less committal about it, to be quite honest, and just said they're splitting. So maybe he's like two, he's uh, ahead of himself a little bit there. Who knows? But I will say this. I like that it's at least a conversation because I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or – uh, the the listeners and the watchers on YouTube can correct me if I'm wrong and put it in the, the comments as well. I think Kansas State ceiling exponentially grows if Damian Eli Leo is being productive enough and has improved enough to where it's a question whether he might have surpassed Uso Sayamalo. Yeah, I would agree with that because I think – you look at it right now and and you think, okay, Uso's older, you know, what how how like the size too, like Damian Elio is not like necessarily small, but he is a little bit more undersized for Crafty. the position that he's playing. Yeah. And and look, I, I've been the biggest Damian Eli Leo supporter for a long time because I saw him play multiple years at Manhattan High. And he Anyone just, that saw him in high school. He's yep. scrappy, made plays, uh, was a fantastic wrestler. So like you knew that that guy is going to be able to figure it out and get it to translate to this, this next level. But uh, that's another one of those that you put in the category of maybe it should be a little bit of a concern on Uso, who's you know now played two seasons at K-State. But really, I think more emphasis should be put on how good news that is for what Damian Eli Leo is doing, similar to Austin Romain at linebacker is how I would view it, where the fact that we've got all this Austin Romain buzz at linebacker, which – did not calm down at all today with Joe Klanderman speaking. I think that's a significant deal, and that's kind of the the same type of deal where it shows those guys are making big steps and strides, and that really elevates K-State's ceiling. Some of the guys coming on are the guys that need to come on for Kansas State to be special on defense, which is why I'm starting to really buy into the hype on this side of the ball and reason why I'm not really like, 
oh, this must mean Uso is hitting a wall because in the same breath, he calls Damian Elon Leo as the starter. He says Uso just had probably the two or three best practices since he's been at K-State. So, I mean, just put put those pieces together and you just see this defense is really flourishing right now. And I think they're, I think they'd like to suppress some of it, but they're having a hard time. They're just, they're rolling with it because they're that excited. But so the, I thought that was big. And, and I don't know if Drew tackled this, but I thought one of my most impressive players during the open practice that we saw was Asher Tomaszewski, who's the third defensive tackle. And that was another guy, again, we're, we'll get into it tomorrow, but Joe Klanderman mentioned his name uh, today as well. So the, the interior defensive line, that's probably the spot on the defensive side of the ball that had the most question marks or concern uh, from people. If we're talking just like upside a mass appeal and everything else, like everybody else, I think you could look around and go, okay, linebackers, you feel pretty good about having some options there. The secondary seems to be set up really well right now, but there were questions about what they were going to do uh, at, at defensive tackle, and they seem like they're going in a good spot. So I'll, I'll make it easy for you. Uh, we'll just kind of do this thing in order. We'll step just a couple of uh, spots outside of the, the interior guys. What did you make of what Buddy Wyatt had to say yesterday about the defensive ends? I thought it was interesting, like the roles that he said, like little, little nuggets of each player. Um, I, I forget if it was me that kind of said, that kind of got him into, you know, how we align these chess pieces and how we distribute these snaps are is going to be challenging. We know Brendan Mott can probably do a little bit of everything because he is the elder statesman of the group is kind of that dude. And you got Cody Stuffelbean, who was with the ones during practice, kind of surprised me that it, that's still the case. But um, we'll see how long he can hold off some of these young stars. Uh, Chidi Obiizor is a guy that's just a massive dude um, that they can do a lot of different things with because of his length and power and strength and, you know, all of those things. Uh, but th they have a lot of depth. Some of it's not proven yet, so they need to work on those things. I know everyone loves the idea of Toby Osansami, as do I, because he's a blur, right? Mm -hmm. Explosive, fast, got to get used to working on the line of scrimmage still a little bit what it sounded like. Uh, Chidi is being Chidi so far. It seemed like a little bit steady so far in training camp. Jordan Allen needed to take a little bit of an improvement in pass rush, slowly working that way so it's interesting that, that was the area where they wanted to attack with him it sounded like to me that some of the better training camps at that spot were of course brendan mott who they knew what they had already but ryan davis seems like somebody that is starting to come on i forget what player it was that we spoke to where someone said name a player who's standing out that maybe didn't in the spring all of a sudden is coming on during training camp it was the second player that we spoke to i believe and he said, Ryan Davis. So I thought that was interesting. And another one, the buddy Wyatt raved, uh, raved about, he, he had good things to say about. And this person was also talked up by a player, was Travis Bates. And what buddy Wyatt said was he's the best interior pass rusher. So it seems like they do have some of these sub packages built into where these defensive ends are going to, they're going to have three or four on the field at the same time. Some of them are going to play inside. That seems to be one of the specialties of Travis Bates, the Austin P transfer. And, you know, the Ryan Davis conversation is interesting too because it feels like that's one of those guys that within the last handful of months has kind of had this quick ascension from uh, not really sure what this is going to be to now like he he's going to be right there in the thick of it long term at that position for K-State kind of battling it out where this is this is a deep group but not necessarily like deep with high end talent yet. Like that's going to take time to develop. Um, I don't want to, people will probably take this in a derogatory way just because uh, they probably still have a little bit of upset feelings about how it went. But I would honestly compare the defensive ends are a lot like the, the most recent K state basketball team where there are a lot of, really good players at that spot but i don't know right now that you have anybody that is elite and great like you know the team the the year prior that went to the elite eight you had those stars where i would say honestly the the flip side of that is probably the linebackers right now 
where you do have two really clearly defined stars in Des Prunell and Austin Moore. And then everything else behind that is, yeah, you know, if, if things go right, we're going to have the depth that we want, but we're kind of in wait and see mode. But you have two really high end guys locking down that position. And then everything else is kind of dudes that might take a couple of games to get adjusted, but then they'll be ready to go, which is, I mean, Austin Romaine, maybe he's getting the buzz right now that it seems like they're expecting him to be ready to go game one and not have to do that adjusting. But I think there will be other guys like that. So that's that would be my comparison that I make for the defense right now is the, the, the edge guys are like K-State basketball this past year, and the, the linebackers are set up like K-State basketball the year prior. Yeah. And I would say I think the strength of this team is actually the secondary. I think they might there's there's an argument to be made I mean, they have the best secondary. Find me a hole in the secondary right now. Yeah, yeah. They, they might have the best secondary in the Big Twelve. Yeah. Uh speaking of the linebackers, what uh did you take away from Steve Standard yesterday? Yeah, I thought it was interesting where he said we got three linebackers ready to go, and none of them were Alec Marenko. So that was and and I know it's because they said he really got set back quite a bit because he was not with Kansas State in the spring and then got banged up right at the beginning of training camp. And it's hard to really get into the thick of things when those types of things happen. You're basically not around for the most important parts of development, of practice, of anything, right? So it's hard. So they have, I, I mean, to me, I don't know that anyone's really spelled it out this way. It seems like one, Austin Romaine. Two, Terry Kirksey, maybe the surprise of training camp at this point, where I thought the buzz at first was like, oh, that you know, just like, oh, this guy's doing okay. Oh, okay. He's not he's not a nobody. Now everyone's saying like he's a dude. So I, I think that's legitimate. I think he's going to play this year. Three, Bo Palmer, and four, I guess would be Alec Marenko. Maybe he has room to uh, climb those ranks, considering what they needed from him and why they added him in the first place. But obviously, has a ways to. He, he's kind of dug himself a hole, in a, and and not to his own debt, and not like his own fault. Like I, it's not because he's not good enough. It's like a guy that came here late, and now the injury bug that has plagued him his entire career is plagued him again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, to yeah. be to be honest, and and to clarify, he was he didn't even have a red limited contact jersey on on Monday, so maybe he's snapping out of it. All right, uh, corners wise, Van Malone spoke yesterday. And he's got you know a little bit more of a general appeal with the defense and kind of where his role sits uh, now, as we covered with the assistant head coach tag. But uh, what did you make of of him talking about his position group? Because those are one of the the groups of guys that Chris Kleiman fueled the fire for early on with the praise for Keenan Garber and Jacob Parrish. So, uh, what did you make of Van Malone? Yeah, probably didn't have a whole lot of takeaways for his own position group because we kind of just know what it is. Yeah, it's it's well known right now. Yeah, we know Keen Garber and Jacob Parrish are, are going to be the guys. We know Justice James is probably going to be the number three guy. And I, I think, quite frankly, people probably didn't give him enough credit for not a ton of playing time the last year or two, but it was pretty good what he played. So I, I had kind of confidence already that he was going to be the number three guy. The fact that he's pulling away probably makes me feel even better. And then number four, corner and the number four corner K State plays a little bit, right? I, I think that's where Justice James has kind of been the last two years. It, it sounds like a pretty heated battle between Donovan McIntosh, who drew rave reviews today from Jordan Riley, Kanigel Thomas, who's been in a red limited contact jersey a little bit. And those guys are they both redshirt freshmen? Kanigel might be a sophomore. He may not have redshirt. Yeah. I, I well, I think I think maybe he did, but I'd have to I'd have to check I, on that. To I'll be, work right here. Can I just sophomore? Okay. He's a sophomore. He played he played, played enough on special, special teams. teams. Yep. So, but they're in the same class, but now they have different class distinguished. Now that Kanijo did not Richard and Donovan did, and then on top of that, Jordan Dunbar, the transfer from Rice, that's played a lot of Group of Five ball. So, you you got what you want at the position. To be honest, the most interesting stuff of Keenan Garver was when he was not talking about the quarterbacks or from Van Malone, sorry, it was when he was not talking about the quarterbacks calling Jordan Riley over and over the alpha, which to be honest, go look at his interview. It's on our YouTube channel yeah. right now. He is an alpha like that dude could command a room. And it was similar to what I thought to when you're talking to Keegan Johnson, like you, you just know, you could tell like the back and forth 
and the eye contact and the command of the room that you're talking to a grown ass adult. I felt that way with Keen Johnson. I felt that way with Jordan Riley. So that that was a takeaway. And then have Van provide us a little bit of insight on the in helmet communication when it comes to the defense. How much are you going to use it on defense? You don't want to. And Joe Klanderman also said this. Mm-hmm. You don't want to talk when you're talking to the. It's probably going to be a linebacker. You don't want to say too much because then you give him too much information, and he's like, he's got all this stuff. He's like, yeah. oh, I got to watch out for this. I got to watch out for that. Like you can't really do that. And in college ball, it's going to be tricky because you rotate linebackers a lot more. Like the green dot guy. Like you get you better be. Like Al Serby is going to be on the clock this year. He's got to make sure the right guy with all these subs has the right helmet on. And that's going to be tricky in itself. And then on top, how much are you going to use the end helmet communication when those offenses go, go so fast? So I think the, the in helmet communication will probably play a larger role in the offensive side of the ball than defense. Defense, you just got to be careful because you can screw it up a little bit more. Yeah, and they they've also made it known that like they're still going to have their signals ready to go because it's going to call for that, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how they get accustomed to it throughout the year. I think the offense is going to love it. I don't think that it'll be much of a problem for them once it gets going. The defense, I think they'll be in a spot where hey, it'll be nice to have, but we're not going to rely on it. Yeah, uh, and then another thing Malone said I thought was a good takeaway was the fact that he's like, you know, for. A handful of years, probably even the 2022 Big 12 season, we'd look into our different position rooms and we'd look at and we'd see two or three guys and be like, those two or three can really, really run. He's like, now we go into each position room. It's like, I got to find one that can't. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. What we've heard depth and speed have basically been the two resounding uh, repeated words throughout K-State's fall camp when talking about the defense, which we will talk more about tomorrow when we discuss the words of Joe Klanderman. And uh, if you want to do a little bit of homework before you hear from our thoughts on Joe Klanderman, you can go watch the full press conference from the K-State defensive coordinator right here on the KSO YouTube page. So that will do it for us today. Back again tomorrow. If you want more news and coverage on the Cats with everything that's gone down to start this week, Go to On3, find kstateonline.com. Make sure to get signed up if you're not and become a member of uh, what I would consider a very elite group of K-State fans. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We're out of here. Thanks for watching K-State Online.